This program is brought to you by Emory University. Okay, our final speaker for today um, is really going to complete the puzzle. We've heard from Dr. Price about uh, the physical changes that the elderly undergo. We heard from David Blake about how to investigate elder exploitation and what's out there. Um, and now we were going to hear from Gerald Ross. She is the judge in charge of probate court in DeKalb County. Uh, she's been involved with probate court since 1985, and she's been the chief judge of probate court since 2003. Um, as I said at the beginning, she's also a valued member of our task force to fight elder exploitation in DeKalb County. Um, her commitment to that task force is admirable and very welcome, and um, I know she has a lot to tell us about what happens in probate court and how civilly in probate court uh, we can try to protect our elders through certain programs um, so maybe things don't reach the level where David Blake or I have to become involved in the criminal justice system. So um, I'm welcoming Judge Gerald Ross to the podium. Thank you. Can you hear me? Am I too loud? No. Okay. I love small groups. It makes it a little easier. I would love that you would move down, but you're not going to anyway, so we'll just ignore that. Um, I'm going to change a little bit. Um, I think it was somewhere on the program that um, you were supposed to wait till my presentation to ask questions, and I was going to do that even if it was a larger group. Please just jump in. Um, after 28 years in this field, if I can't get back to where I was, I may need a guardian. So with that said, let me um, also give some tribute to Jean Canavan and, and her office. Um, having been there for so long, it used to be that I would try to contact the DA's office, and I'm not trying to insult the past DA's, but simply just to say it is wonderful and reassuring to me that I know I have someone working on getting the people off the street who are doing bad things. I can't do that. I can do other things, and we'll talk about that, but it's very reassuring to know that, and so I'm so very happy about that. When I was asked to speak, I love to talk about guardianships. Of course, the probate course does a whole array of things that we're not going to go into now, um, but probably guardianships are the closest to my heart because we are talking about a live person and what we can do to make their lives better. And of course, I hear will contests all the time where, and I don't want to say they're greedy beneficiaries. I know people are looking for property that may be sentimental to them, but it just means more to me when the person is there and we're talking about the effects on their life. Not that the will doesn't enter in sometime. I have actually been in a guardianship hearing more than once when they start raising their hands and saying, but I'm the beneficiary under the will, to which I promptly reply, I don't care. I really don't care that you're supposed to get something when your mother passes away, and she's sitting right there. I care that she is able to utilize her funds to live out her life in the best way possible. Um, it's always a sign to me when they start raising their hands and telling me that. So with that said, unfortunately we're going to have to talk a little bit procedural or you won't really be able to understand how we get to my court to begin with. And I know it can be very boring, um, procedure always is, but it's just one of those necessary evils to talk about. Let me first say we have guardianship and we have conservatorship. The simple explanation that I usually give people without going into the standard, but I will read the standard to you in a second, is guardianship is over everyday decisions, such as medical consent, such as residential, um, where someone is going to live, which is so often the subject of a guardianship hearing, because as you know, and also for purposes of this discussion, we do guardianships over people who have been brain injured, people with developmental disabilities, 
I could go on and on, and even minors, but we're not going to talk about that for today. We'll focus on the elderly, but just so that you know, it doesn't just cover the elderly. And I'm not going to keep saying alleged ward. When someone has a guardian or a conservator appointed for them, they, they, they then become a ward of the court. I know that you can't have a ward until the hearing is done, and just for purposes of this, it's cumbersome to keep saying alleged ward. So as far as a guardian, that again is for decisions over someone's personal type of decisions. And the burden of proof is that the petitioner present clear and convincing evidence that the proposed ward lacks sufficient capacity to make or communicate significant responsible decisions concerning his or her safety, or that they can't communicate significant responsible decisions concerning the management of their property, and that would be the conservator. The conservator is in charge of their money and their property if they have real estate and any other property um, descriptions that you can think of, stocks and bonds, et cetera. They're not mutually exclusive. You may have a case that you may have a guardian and not have a conservator. Sometimes that would be, of course, where someone really doesn't have any assets and they simply get Social Security and the guardian can take their letters of guardianship, which they get after the hearing. They can go to Social Security and obtain Social Security without going through a guard, um, conservatorship, and they report to Social Security. I'm not sure how up-to-date Social Security is on auditing those returns. I know that on the returns that we have filed as conservator, we do our best to audit those, and we'll talk about that a little later. Let's talk about how we start this procedure when someone needs a guardian. As you can tell, this petition, I'm not even going to hold it up, is 13 to 14 pages long. It is quite complicated. People will always say, do I have to have a lawyer? And my answer to that really is, how complicated is this guardianship? Also, what is the state of mind of the petitioner? In other words, guardianship can be very, very emotional. You are basically a parent, someone's nodding and obviously they've had some either personal or business um, experience with this. You are taking the place of your parent. They have raised you, and I'm going to talk about the parent now, they have raised you all of your life and all of a sudden you are stepping in as the parent. It can be very emotional for the petitioner. It can be very emotional for the ward. Rights are being taken away. And our job is to try to make it the least restrictive alternative. That's a very important phrase to remember. Um, you don't want to do what we call a full-fledged guardianship if you can let the ward maintain certain rights so that they maintain their independence. Remember that the right to vote is not taken away in a guardianship, and that is something quite often raised. It's very important to people that they obtain their right to vote. Of course, I always make a joke and say, as long as you vote for me, that's okay. You can keep that right. But they, um, that's an important right, the right to drive a vehicle. Guardianship does not take away the right to drive a car you as guardian would have to go to the motor vehicle department and try to get that procedure started. Taking away someone's driver's license is like so taking away their freedom. I know from my personal experience right now, my mother for the first time is not, does not have a car. She certainly could hardly drive in South Florida. She's certainly not gonna drive in Atlanta, Georgia. I don't even like driving in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, but it's you're taking away the, the really the, the right to get to places. Um, again, you're becoming a child. A child can't drive. You have to ask someone to take you everywhere. So as you can see, guardianship is really very emotional. So getting back to what I said before, as far as do you need an attorney? If you're so emotionally involved, I would recommend it. And of course, it all depends on the size of the estate. Um, but with that said, 
it's not that easy a procedure, and particularly if your mother, father, whoever is fighting you on it. Okay, you fill out this petition, and we, are, we try to be helpful in the court. We can't practice law, but the clerk really does try to help as much as she can. And I know that as you start listening to what you have to do, the cost involved, you're going to say, why would someone do a guardianship? And sometimes, and, and Doris, I know that you're aware of this, it can have a very negative connotation. People think the state is taking over. I'm, I'm not sure where that comes from. I also have a lot of that when someone dies with, without a will. Oh, no, the state's going to take my money. Well, that, that's not true, and that's a big misconception that goes on. But remember these two words for me, protection and court oversight, because these are two things that are not afforded with the other options or the lesser restricted options, such as a power of attorney or an advanced directive. But we'll talk a little bit more about that, and let's get back to the filing so we can get through that part of it. To file a petition for guardianship, you must have either two petitioners, and just because they're petitioning does not necessarily mean they're asking to be the guardian. In other words, Jean Canavan could come in and file a petition. She's certainly, or most likely, not going to be asking to be the guardian, but she may ask that the independent county person, the Division of Aging, step in, or the county um, conservator step in. Um, so you don't, just because you're the petitioner doesn't necessarily mean you're asking to be the guardian. Once that petition comes to me and it's filled out, it comes to me and I review it to see if there's probable cause. And then if I find that the petition does have probable cause, I will do an order appointing an evaluator and setting the date of the evaluation and in that, it also gives the ward the right to hire their own lawyer. Then, I hate this part, but unfortunately, it is what it is. The law requires that a sheriff do sheriff service on the person. And that can be quite scary. And what you can do is appoint a special agent who's not dressed with all the guns and, and stuff and may not be quite as, as threatening to the person. Let's talk about the evaluation for a minute. I can have an evaluation done either by a psychiatrist, psychologist, or a clinical social worker. I don't know if any of you fit that bill here, so, but I'm still going to go ahead and put my plug in for it. I need a list of evaluators. I have several, and they are overworked. The pay, I let's look at it, you're doing it for charity. The pay is 125 a report. If they're subpoenaed, then of course that's something they have to arrange with the person that they're getting subpoenaed by. But I do need evaluators. And sometimes for people just starting off or who just have a good heart, they may want to do that. They range anywhere from 30 minutes to two hours. Quite often, as Dr. Price mentioned, a mini mental, mental status report is done. These reports are supposed to be independent. Not always the case. Quite often, the evaluator will get to the house, and everybody's there for this occasion, including what I call the nosy neighbors. Um, so it's very hard. Now, they can review in most facilities. They are able, if it's at a nursing home, a hospital, even under the HIPAA laws, I have, they've, we have gotten to where they can review the medical records. Um, there are a few facilities, which will remain nameless, that won't allow them to do so. Um, the other thing, I have one little problem with the evaluations. I have one person who quite often, even in their evaluation of the person, kind of tells me how to rule. And that I don't need, <laughs> but I appreciate that they're getting so involved, and so we have already spoken to them that I really don't need to be told how to rule. Um, when the evaluation comes back, if it comes back not recommending a guardian, 
What we do is we call the petitioner and we let them know that. The evaluation is not set in stone. That does not mean we're not going to appoint a guardian, but it just means that they have a little much more of a hurdle to get over. So we give them the option at that point of withdrawing the petition, um, but quite often they don't and we'll go forward with it. Um, and they may subpoena the evaluator at that point so they can cross-examine. And also the ward has the right to their own independent evaluation during this time period. Once we get the evaluation back, the hearing cannot be set before a 10-day time period. Let's talk for a minute also about the appointment of the attorney. That's really important here. Um, we have a list, and not everyone is meant for this kind of work. Um, you have to have a big heart. You have to have patience. And the one thing that I always say, too, because you are, as the attorney appointed, they are the advocate for this person. If that person cannot even tell you what day it is, cannot tell you their name without thinking about it, if they do not want a guardian, that attorney still has to advocate for them. And so they can look silly, but they know me. I've been there long enough. I know what they're doing. And if it's really to the point that they feel there's no way this person must, for their safety, have someone to protect them, they can come to me and ask that we have a guardian ad litem appointed. We don't do it on every case. Budgets unfortunately it doesn't always allow it. Um, and by the way, the attorney is paid the same thing the evaluator is paid, 125 per guardianship. We try to schedule five or six in a day to make it somewhat profitable for, for the attorney. The difference in the function of the attorney and the guardian ad litem is also very important because quite often people really get confused about it. The attorney is the advocate. He is actually coming in and he is a reflection and the communicator for what these people want, whether they want a guardian, whether they don't, every single thing, where the guardian ad litem standard is what is in the best interest of this person. So it's a major difference. In some cases where the court will even go ahead and appoint a guardian ad litem um, is where, A, if the person decides to hire their own lawyer. Think about it. They are coming in asking for this person to have a guardian because they don't have the ability to contract. However, they're entering into a contract with an attorney. So it's kind of a hard balance, and the law does not help me out at all on this. So what I do is I appoint a guardian ad litem. Whoever I was going to appoint as the attorney, all of a sudden they become the guardian ad litem. And we may even have a hearing on whether the person is competent to hire a lawyer. Lawyers have gotten themselves in a mess with this. Sometimes, and I'm not putting lawyers down, I love lawyers, I am one, but sometimes you have good and bad in every profession, as we know. And they may see a big bank account sitting there. And yet, your reputation, and I don't know if there are any lawyers in here right now, is very important because I will always remember those cases where, and I remember one in particular, where we actually had a hearing on whether the person could hire their own lawyer. We get in there, the ward gets on the stand, and when the attorney who supposedly she's had several meetings with and entered into a contract, she looks up at him and she goes, who in the hell are you? That was obvious the hearing was over. She had no idea who he was. I remember who he was though. And I will never forget that. Now, maybe she had a lucid interval or something when she hired him, so maybe we can give him the benefit of the doubt. Now, let's talk about the hearing, the waiver of the presence of the ward. I usually rely on my attorney to waive the presence of that person, but I'm pretty strict about it. If they can communicate their wishes and desires to me, in some form or fashion, this hearing is about them. And it's very important. And I want them to be able to be there. Now, if they're comatose, obviously not. 
If they are in the very advanced stages of Alzheimer's, of course not. Use common sense on this. Now, what I do run into quite often is where a person is, mobility-wise, would have a very difficult time getting to the courthouse, but is able to communicate. What do you do there? I go wherever they are. I will go to the nursing homes. I will go to their house. I will go, I have held hearings in the front yard when the hearing, when it was impossible to go into someone's home. And I feel like it's important that they be able to tell me what they want. It's wreaked havoc with the security, with the sheriff's department, because I am giving up the security, and I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, I'm just never afraid, that's just me. Afraid to fly, but not afraid of going anywhere without security. Um, I, one time, out in, I think it was Stone Mountain, if I recall, I made a very silly decision. It was late on a Friday, and the house was full of people, full of relatives, and I should have waited to make the ruling, but I didn't and a big fight broke out in the house. Now, I wasn't afraid, they really weren't, it was amongst themselves, but ever since then, two deputies must accompany me, one to stand outside and one to stand inside, and it's probably a good idea. Um, yeah, it's, um, the other thing about these hearings is try to make the ward as comfortable as possible. So often, they have never entered a courtroom. And I've had them look at me and say, why am I here? I have never done anything, I've not done anything wrong. And how sad is that? That they have to end up in a courtroom and I wanna to try to make it as comfortable for them as I can. I have some pet peeves, but the lawyers who have been practicing in this area of law, they know those pet peeves. Don't badger some elderly person on the stand so that you can prove to me that they're not competent. Trust me, after a few minutes, usually I can tell. And not that I always make the right decision, I try my best. But please don't badger some elderly person and try to trip them up. This is not the place to do that. Don't be Perry Mason in the probate court. Also, don't talk about them as if they're not there. I even know when I, when I was raising my children, you were never allowed to say she when the person was sitting there. It was just a hang up I had. And I feel the same in the guardianship hearings. This is a person sitting there. Maybe they're not catching every single thing you're saying, but believe me, they know more than you think. And they know when the families are fighting and calling each other names. One little story, too, that I always never forgot. Um, an attorney was trying to show that this elderly lady had lost a lot of weight. Quite often, older people lose weight. That doesn't mean they're not competent. You need a lot more than that. And the attorney went up to her, and needless to say, he was a little bit um, obese himself. And he goes up to her, and, and she's very thin, and he says, how much weight have you lost, Miss So-and-so? She goes, not as much as you need to lose. <laughs> and I thought, way to go. You go, girl. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit, oh, one other thing of the deputies in the courtroom. I've had to really work with the deputies um, because they're not used to these type of hearings. We can have five or six guardianships going on in a day, and you may have someone with developmentally dis who's developmentally disabled, um, older people who just, you know, there's no filter sometime. And they're yelling out, and, they're, and I am fine with it. I have learned I can ignore it, I can block it out. Please don't rep reprimand them. Please don't make someone in a wheelchair rise. And that only happened once. But you do have to make the decorum in the courtroom just a little bit different than it normally is. Um, and recognize that there's chaos in there. 
and I can, I can deal with it. It's when the people who are not the wards and the subjects who are being chaotic, that's a different story. We also have what we call, oh, just let me also go back to say that the procedure for a permanent guardianship is probably about four to six weeks that we can get that set down with all those notice provisions that are within the law. We also have what we call an emergency guardianship. Those hearings can be set within three to five days. Now, what constitutes an emergency? I will tell you that that differs from one county to the other. I interpret it, and I know I have a reputation for this, I interpret it very liberally, I do. I would rather not compromise someone's safety and immediately say, no, this is not an emergency, and let my attorney that I have appointed, let them deal with that issue. I don't want to take the chance that I may harm someone by not looking into it simply because it doesn't appear to be an emergency. Now, with that said, there's some common sense things with that. As attorneys, don't mail in emergencies. That never goes over well with me, especially with the county mail. Could sit in the mail room for two days. What kind of emergency is that that you're mailing in? And as an attorney, if you, if you file an emergency, don't start calling and saying the date doesn't suit you. So with that said, you, you still have to use some common sense with, with emergencies. Um, and there are different standards for emergency. And basically, I think I have it right here that I can read to you. Um, basically, it's if the threat is so immediate and the potential harm so irreparable that any delay is unreasonable and the existence of the threatened risk and potential for irreparable harm is certified by the affidavit of a, a physician. And that goes to both, like if someone is stealing money out of someone's bank account, that type of thing, if there's a medical decision that needs to be made, those are type of emergencies. Sometimes we get to where we have um, the situation where someone is being kept we can use Wesley Woods as an example, and it's time for their discharge. Now, I know, and I've worked with Wesley Woods long enough, that they're not going to put the person on the street until someone's in a legal capacity to decide where the person lives. But they could. And I, I just would rather, again, look at it, and it's my job to be there. Yes, it causes a little bit of havoc to set this hearing so quickly and to get a lawyer, but again, I feel like that's why we are there. Now we even have what we call a pre-hearing emergency. That is where someone comes in and they know that someone is taking money out of that person's bank account as they, as they speak. Or if there's some type of um, medical emergency that needs to be addressed in three to five days may still be too long of a time period for them to wait. What I do, and again the law really doesn't give me a lot of guidance, so what I do on those is I make sure I have a lawyer over there. The ward's never there, but I do have someone representing them and the order that they walk out with, if it's a pre-hearing conservatorship, is basically an order that they can take to the financial institution and freeze the assets. Um, so we will do those now. The cost involved with this. I did have it. Hold on just for a second. Well, I don't have to give you the exact cost, but I will tell you that to do a permanent guardianship is about $484. That includes the appointment of the attorney and the evaluator. And the cost of an emergency is about $424. Pre-hearing, $125. You could end up, if you need all three of those, you may end up with near $1,000 in court cost. Now, with that said, we have what we call, I don't know what, I forget what the official name, we call it pauper's affidavits, 
And we do get a tremendous amount where people are asking that the court fees be waived. We run into the age-old problem, and I'm sure everybody who works within a court system where you have to take filing fees in, that people are lying on their affidavits. You know, I do have people walk in and with a, I don't know if it's a knockoff or not, but with these designer bags, you know, or getting into fancy cars. But again, what I try to focus on is not that person not telling the truth, but the elderly person who needs protection. And so with that said, I don't want to deter people from coming in and filing. Let's just say it's a neighbor. Well, it's not the neighbor's assets that are counted against for the filing fees. It is the proposed wards. And if they think they have to come out of pocket 400 and something dollars, they may not bring it. And I don't want to risk that. So I just have to answer to my auditor, and I do on that. I'm sure after, do you all have any questions at this point? Because I'm fine if you do. No, OK. After you take, after someone is appointed, they take their oath, and then they have to post a bond. People get very upset when they have to post a bond, but it's the law, and I really do not have any latitude in that. And it really is quite disturbing to, let's say it's someone's spouse, and even the money is in some of its joint. Um, joint bank accounts are another issue that's a major problem, and I'm sure, Jean, you have seen this. Let's talk about that just for a second, because I think that's something very important, even though we're going off course a little bit, that's OK. In Georgia, if you are on someone's bank account, if your mother has put you on that bank account, when she passes away, that money is determined to be yours, much to the chagrin of the other brothers and sisters. Now, that doesn't mean you can't go to superior court and try the title to that bank account, but I will tell you, it is a hard burden to overcome. And where I get upset, and I don't know if anybody here works for a bank or not, they don't explain that to people. And people think they're just going on as a convenience factor, but it's really a lot more than that. And so people put their children, and even when the children are honest, a lot of times that's not what the person intended you know, you may have other siblings, and they, she may have wanted that money divided. But of course, when they're not honest, that's even more problems, which often will end up needing a guardian for that purposes, for that purpose. Now, I am sure after you, oh, let me also go, they post a bond. How you calculate the bond amount, and it, the bond is like, and they don't like for me to explain it like this, but it's the simplest way is like an insurance policy against mismanagement. It is a way that perhaps that money, if someone uses it for their own purposes, if the conservator decides he wants to use it to send his children to college, I've had a lot worse things that it's been used for, but if it's used for that, the bond can then be used to replace the person's funds and make them whole again. So. We bond for one year of income, plus whatever liquid assets are in that estate. They have gotten very difficult to obtain. If you have any bankruptcy on your record, if you have a bankruptcy, garnishment, any type of record, you're not going to get a bond, most likely. And that's when I would have to turn to my county conservator to do so, because no one in the family can get bonded. Um, we use the county conservator not just for that type of situation, but also we even use it where the family relations are so bad that if I point anyone in the family, they'll be back in court next week. Sometimes we simply have to go to the county, you know, for that purposes, for those purposes. Also, we have some cases sometimes that are so complicated. I had one last week that involves a lot of different things. A woman's annuity seems like the insurance agent may have been in on 
this little scheme going on, that the person who would be guardian would still have to appoint a lawyer regardless. So sometimes from a practical standpoint, it's better to appoint the county conservator. I have three. They work on a rotating basis. Um, sometimes from that, they know all these legal, all the legal avenues that they have to take. Now, do they do it for free? Of course not. And of course, I always have to tell the people, but my gosh, if you have to go out and hire lawyers to fight each other, that will run up the bill even more. But there's a statutory fee for the county conservators, um, and it's like 2.5% in and out. And then there's some other uh, my, more minor figures that they can get. They can also ask for extra compensation if they are doing a tremendous amount of court work if it's a protracted hearing in my court, if they're having to go try a title action. Because when someone becomes conservator, it puts them in that legal authority to be able to pursue all of these various things to try to perhaps go after someone who has um, taken the ward's money. Now, I, again, can't take the person off the street who's doing this but I can certainly try to make the person whole again, or if I can't do that, at least from the, this point forward, protect them and put them in an environment that they should be living in, not in a basement eating dog food while the money goes for drugs. And I'd like to say that's a rare occurrence, but unfortunately, it's not so rare. So Jean can get them off the street, and I can try to make them whole again. We also audit the conservators. I may have said that earlier. Um, they f have to file an annual return every year. Uh, that was silly. Of course, if it's an annual return, it's every year. Um, an asset management plan and um, an inventory when they first become um, conservator. We do our best to keep up with the auditing. I think DeKalb County does a pretty good job. And if the conservator is not doing what he's supposed to do. We will cite them into court. That's where the bond comes in. The bonding company is also cited um, into the court so that they, of course, want to come in and defend the person. It's almost like the person gets their lawyer because they have the same interest not to have a judgment put against them. And the end result can be a money judgment, which the bonding company will quite often pay out, and then they'll pursue the wrongdoer. And that's how that process works. I've worked very closely with an attorney named Tim Burson. If you ever need to know anything about fiduciary bonds, he is the expert and has been quite helpful to the court. Now, after hearing all of this, the notice times, the, the need to maybe get an attorney, um, the emotional term, toil, I mean, um, the emotional toll that it takes on everybody. Why do you do a guardianship? Why not try other things? Well, remember when I said to you, protection and oversight. Powers of attorney, they provide none of that. Now, with that said, if you have a father knows best family, who has one of those? I don't know many, okay? If you have a father knows best family, if you have a family that communicates with each other. In other words, mother gives, I'm just going to use Jean an example, gives Jean a power of attorney, and Jean has siblings, which I know she does. This needs to be communicated to them, because if they find out about it and it hasn't been told, they immediately, it's that whole control issue. So if a family, so far we've got honest, communicative. If you have, at that horrible age with the glasses off and on, if you've got that situation, then perhaps it will work. But remember, if you give someone a power of attorney, if you're an attorney and you're doing this, please make sure or do whatever you can to ensure that that person is competent to give a power of attorney. It's probably less standards to do a will than power of attorney, but both I, I look at it the same way. Because as an attorney, if you come into this courtroom and then evidence is given that it was so obvious that that person 
could not give a power of attorney. It's your reputation that's tarnished. So you've got all of these various things. Again, honesty, communicative. Other one, bank won't accept it. We're having a lot of issues with that. They want it on their own form, which doesn't make any sense. So again, make sure we have people come in simply because the bank won't accept the power of attorney. Competency. And again, there is no court oversight on a power of attorney. I will venture to tell you, the major not the majority, but a lot of my cases that come in for conservatorship is power of attorneys that been, have been abused. Another situation that happens, the playing favorites. Mother is bedridden. Children are coming in, and she's giving power of attorneys out like they were candy. We will have five or six power of, competing power of attorneys going on. So again, those are the reasons. I am not saying that it's not the way to go, but you have to have all of those factors. And those aren't factors in the law. Those are my own factors, just based on what I have seen through the years. Advanced directives. Again, great, as long as someone is not abusing it. If the person that someone gave, told to be the agent under an advanced directives, is neglecting the person, then obviously there needs to be some type of avenue to get rid of that person and to appoint a, a guardian. Now, there's some conflicting code sections if you read them. Under Title 29, when a guardian is appointed, it distinctly says the mere appointment of a guardian does not revoke the power of an agent appointed under an advanced directive. I'm shortening that a little. However, I knew that can't be because what if, again, what if that person is abusing them? So if you go under Title 31-32-6 under C, it definitely gives the court, the court has to make a finding, but it definitely states that the guardianship can be, I mean the advanced directives can be revoked by my guardianship order. And now also note that on the guardianship petition, and I neglected to say this earlier, whoever holds a power of attorney Whoever is the health care power, if there's a health care, a lot of people still have a power of attorney for health care purposes, like me, who needs to get an advanced directives and get it updated. I'm as bad as what they say a doctor is as far as being a patient. Um, but you definitely, um, what, what was I saying? I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Jean, help me. Right, right, um, that it can be revoked. Um, and of course, it has to be able to, to be done like that. Why does the elderly, and, and oh, let me talk about this lady I had from Georgia Tech. Um, I had a lady who I think was, a, she was a professor at Georgia Tech. She did everything that someone was supposed to do. She had her advanced directives done, she had her power of attorney done, and she was competent. Everything done, she paid a lot of money to have these put in place. So what I'm trying to say here is, just because you do everything doesn't necessarily come to a good ending. Two nephews came in from out of state, and she had enough wherewithal at this point that she knew something was wrong. They took her to an attorney's office, she revoked all these documents, she did a new will, we won't even, you can guess who the beneficiaries became under the will, and had enough wherewithal to go to her friends and tell them. So of course they then brought guardianship proceedings into the court, because at this point she would have not been competent to do another advanced directives or power of attorney. So I found that to be a very sad case, because this woman had done everything that you were supposed to do but because of these two nephews, it still ended up with a guardianship. Why do the elderly allow themselves for these things to happen? And I'm sure this probably was covered earlier, but just from this court's perspective, loneliness, number one. We are not living in situations like we used to. Who saw my big fat Greek wedding? 
Did anybody ever see that? Great. Would you want to live like that? That's a little much. But I would venture to say that someone elderly, and I remember there was actually an elderly person who kept wandering out in the backyard, and the mother kept running out to get her. Um, it's going to happen less. A scam is going to happen less to someone living in that type of environment than they are living in a house. One child may live in New York. One child lives in California. And they are lonely. They are starved for attention. And if someone comes to the door and they say, you have a tree that's about to fall over in the backyard, oh, come in, have a glass of tea with me. And she will allow them to cut that tree that probably did not need to be cut down for a very high cost. I have asked someone on the stand, why would you give your credit card to a stranger? Because he was nice to me. He provided me a way to the beauty shop. I remember there was a high rise in Buckhead where this man was going from one place to another charging exorbitant gas mileage fees but it got them out, and it gave them someone to talk to. And I really think loneliness is the number one cause of why people allow. People pick people up in the parking lots now. There's a scam over at um, Peachtree Battle Shopping Center in the public store where people stand out in the parking lot to tell people how they can make more off their money. And so many people fall for it. Again, my theory on it is loneliness. Threats to them that if you don't give me some money, you're going to have to move out of the house and I'm putting you into a nursing home. That's very common. You have a household where you had several adult children living in the house for all these years. The ward is the owner of the home and no one pays rent. And all of this is fine until that person needs 24-hour care. And none of these people living in there are willing to do that. They were fine throughout all these years up until that time period. And they have been threatened that I'm putting you in a nursing home if you don't hand over your Social Security check. And probably the number one argument I get from potential wards in a guardianship hearing is I want to stay in my own home. Another reason that I will often go out to the house, because I want to see, unless I can see how they're living there, I don't really know if it's safe for them. Who's watched some of the hoarding shows? Okay. Well, there's hoarding and there's hoarding. Some people like to collect things. But when you collect things to the point that it's not sanitary, or that there's no aisles to get out of the house, and I've been in those homes, that's a different story. If your judgment is so impaired that you're living like that, then perhaps you're not going to be able to stay in your own home. And how many people can afford 24-7 care in their homes? Not many. And then sometimes you have the more fortunate person who can afford that care, and I call them your they're their own worst enemies. They fire every caretaker that comes into the home. So even though they have the funds, they're too stubborn. I think I could be like that, maybe. I often worry about some of the standards for guardianship, like my checkbook, when they try to use the checkbook as an example of why the person needs a conservator. My checkbook's pretty bad. And obviously, obviously though, that alone does not mean you need a guardian. I love to buy shoes. Am I buying more shoes than I need? Probably. If you ask my husband, I'm sure he would say yes. But does that mean I need a conservator? No. But if you are going out and buying so many shoes that you can't pay your mortgage and your rent and pay for your prescriptions, that's a different story.